So welcome everybody to another webinar on gravity. Uh, our speaker today will be Jose Maria Esquiaga. Uh, Jose Maria got his PhD in Madrid in the Universidad Autónoma under the supervision of uh, Professor Juan García Bellido and also the co-supervision of Miguel Zumalacarri, which at the time was in Nordita, if I, if I believe, if I remember correctly. Uh, and after he depended his PhD last year, he moved to the US where he's now a NASA Institute Fellow in working in the University of Chicago. Uh, the research of, of Jose Maria has been focused on applications of modified gravity to cosmology, both for inflationary physics and also to study the problem of dark energy. And well, today he's going to talk about um, how to link this cosmology and fundamental physics using uh, gravitational waves in binary black holes. Um, just before, um, before starting, if you have any question, of course, you, could, you will be able to ask them at the end. Or if you have any problem with the microphone or just don't want to speak publicly, you can write them in the chat and I will read them at the end. Okay, you can start. Thanks a lot, Mario. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I feel very honored to, 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 to give this talk. Uh, I hope like uh, in the future also I, I'm able to, to visit the uh, Trieste. Uh, that, that, will be, that will be awesome. Uh, so, yeah, as Mario said, uh, today uh, I will talk about the broad theme of the talk would be uh, what can we learn about cosmology and fundamental physics with uh, binary uh, black hole mergers. And, and I, I will cover different uh, topics uh, that I've been uh, working recently. Uh, but before, before that, just as a, as a warm up, uh, I think we can all agree that uh, these first uh, five years of gravitational wave astronomy has been really amazing. Uh, we have now, uh, from the first two observing runs, uh, we have a catalog of, of 10 binary black holes and one binary neutron star. And uh, after these first two observing runs that were uh, taking place between 2015 and 2017, uh, this year, there was a third observing run from which we have already uh, uh, four uh, new uh, uh, confident events, uh, which has been announced. But uh, there are many more which are being analyzed and, and hopefully soon uh, will, be, will be released. So this is just uh, the uh, public alert page where you can see that uh, at least uh, 56 candidates have been, uh, has been announced uh, uh, publicly. So, so I think we, we are really seeing uh, on real time how gravitational wave astronomy is growing at a very, uh, very large uh, speed uh, and moving very, very rapidly from just a few detections to numbers which allow to do uh, st statistical measurements and to allow to infer properties of, of the population of, of black holes, properties about cosmology, and this will be uh, what, I, what I will be covering. So something which is uh, interesting of, of the first, uh, of the 10 binary black holes from the first uh, two observing runs is that uh, they have all uh, stellar masses. Well, first of all, the, the fact that, I mean, the, that the typical masses were like around uh, 30 or so was, was uh, a bit of a surprise at the beginning, but uh, the point that I want to emphasize here is that all these uh, uh, events from the first uh, two observing runs are consistent with having a, a, a maximum component mass around 50 solar masses. And why this is uh, something which is remarkable, uh, that is because this uh, observation is, is, is in, in very good agreement with the, with the theory of per instability supernova, which is uh, 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 a theory for the uh, uh, formation uh, of, of black holes that tells that when a, when a star is, uh, is, is massive enough, then uh, it will be able to produce as a gamma rays in its, in its core, which are uh, energetic enough to produce electron and positrons. And these electron and positron pairs, what they do is that they generate a runaway process, which triggers an instability that ends up in a, in a supernova that uh, ejects all the material. So this means that for certain uh, massive uh, stars, no remanent black hole could be produced. And, and precisely the, the mass where this uh, uh, per instability supernova 
is expected to start uh, taking place is around, is around these, uh, these 50 solar masses. Now, uh, the per instability supernova uh, is a process which is not expected to, uh, to last uh, forever in the sense that if you have even higher uh, mass stars, then the, uh, the, the gamma rays will be energetic enough so to make the, the nucleus, uh, the nuclei in the core to, to decay uh, instantaneously. And this is a process which does not run, does not produce any instability. So this means, in other words, that per instability supernova, what predicts is a gap, is a, is a range of masses where there shouldn't be uh, black holes formed directly from stars. So uh, in this uh, first part of the talk, what I, what I will uh, discuss is the possibility of uh, seeing these black holes, uh, which what we call uh, far side binaries in this recent work uh, with Daniel Holt, uh, uh, the prospect of detecting these farsight binaries, which are above the per instability uh, mass gap. Now, probably you have all heard about uh, this one of these latest uh, uh, binary black holes, uh, GW190521, which is the most massive uh, uh, binary detected so far with a total mass uh, of around 150 solar masses. So, from the analysis of, 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 this, of this event uh, alone, uh, using uh, uh, an informative prior, uh, what the LIGO uh, Virgo collaboration found is that uh, uh, the masses uh, which you are seeing in, in this plot, uh, the secondary mass and the primary mass, uh, have, uh, are essentially in the mass gap. So this is so this 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 has bring a lot of attention and there, there are like plenty of papers every day on archive now on that. The, the point, the only point that I want to make here is that uh, this analysis that uh, LIGO and Virgo did uh, is assuming, is just taking this uh, uh, without uh, using an informative priors. Now, if you, if you use priors uh, with information from the population of binary black holes, in particular, the fact that it is very rare uh, for uh, for binary black hole formation channels to have two of the black holes uh, in the in the mass gap, then uh, what uh, Maya and Daniel saw is that uh, there is uh, support within the data uh, so that the uh, one of the uh, of the black holes, uh, the more the most massive one, it's above the gap, and the uh, other one could be uh, below below the gap. So uh, there is a still the, the point that I want to say here is that there is a still uncertainty uh, in this uh, in this uh, claim that the that the binary is within the gap and essentially what we need to do is to do is to un understand this event in the whole context of the all the detections of the of the third observing run. So in this sense, the population analysis for the third observing run uh, is, is going to be very relevant. Uh, and this could be either the hint of, uh, of, of the first black hole above the gap, or it could also be a new uh, subdominant uh, uh, formation channel. Anyway, uh, the fact that uh, uh, LIGO and Virgo uh, uh, are very sensitive uh, to uh, binary black holes uh, uh, within within the within the gap and above the gap, which also tell us why uh, if there is some population in the gap has to be very 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 constrained can be seen from from this plot. So this plot is is uh, is showing the uh, upper bound on the merger rate uh, in the absence of detections as a function of the total mass. And here different curves represent uh, different observing runs. So. The blue solid line is uh, the first two observing runs. Uh, the dotted uh, orange uh, line uh, is O3, and so on and so forth. But what you can see clearly in this plot is that uh, the place where one can uh, make a, a stronger constraints is uh, it's around total masses of uh, of 200 or so. 
So this means that this is the place where LIGO and Virgo detectors are more sensitive to. So the fact that we are not observing uh, plenty of, 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 of binary black holes there tell us that there are, if, if, if there is a population in the gap, it's not going to be very large. Uh, and the other thing that you can see from this plot is that if you go to higher masses, then the constraint start to be uh, uh, less constraining, meaning that it is possible that uh, in few, with uh, future detectors, uh, we, will, we will see uh, black holes uh, above the gap. Now, these uh, binary black holes uh, above the gap will be seen uh, in different ways, uh, depending on whether you are using uh, ground-based detectors or space-based detectors. So what is interesting, so here in this plot is the typical plot of the sensitivity curves of, of different uh, uh, observatories. Uh, again, in blue is a advanced LIGO, uh, and then we have, uh, I have also added third generation detectors, Einstein Telescope, Cosmic Explorer, and then on the left at low frequencies, we have the future space detector LISA. So these uh, 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 binary black holes, uh, which are seen uh, in the merger uh, with ground-based detectors, will be seen in the risk spiral uh, with LISA. Uh, what, what, is, what is interesting is that for typical uh, uh, black holes, which are be below, the, uh, below the, the, the mass gap, uh, LIGO and Virgo, they see them like very clearly. This is the, the dotted line, the, yeah, the dotted line here. Although LISA could see them, but just uh, with, with low sensitivity. But as you move to higher masses, then uh, the opposite starts to happen. So, uh, LISA starts to see these signals for uh, much more clearly, and, and then uh, ground-based detectors uh, uh, start to see only like a very short uh, period of, 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 the, of the merger. So uh, in general, what, what this means is that uh, LISA will be sensitive to more massive uh, binary black holes. So it will be uh, as if these black holes above the gap are at higher masses, then LISA could see them uh, better. So if we take these constraints from the first two observing runs that tell us uh, how, uh, and that, that set an upper bound on the, on the, on the merger rate, uh, we can translate this into the maximum number of detections that we could see uh, with, uh, with, future, uh, with future observing runs. So this is what is plotted here on the left. This is the upper bound on the number of events as a function of the total mass. And here, uh, uh, O2 is just flat because we are taking the constraints from O2, but then uh, we have uh, advanced LIGO, uh, 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 the upgraded version of LIGO, A+, plus, Voyager, which is a transition between uh, second generation and third generation, LISA, Einstein Telescope, and Cosmic Explorer. And here, in, in each of, for each of the detectors, what you are seeing is a solid line, and then you are seeing a band around it. So the, the, the solid line uh, corresponds to the, to, the, to the case in which the merger rate uh, is constant. And the uh, op opposite end of the band is the case in which the merger rate evolves with the start formation rate. So meaning that as you go to higher redshift, uh, it will peak at around redshift uh, uh, of one, uh, between one and two. Uh, so this band, what is telling you is the uncertainty of the merger rate. So this uncertainty on the merger rate of, uh, of the merger rate, redshift evolution, sorry, uh, will uh, affect the number of events. But what you can see is that uh, uh, LISA, for example, and, and, and also ground-based detectors could, could detect tens or hundreds of events uh, uh, above the, the mass gap. Uh, and, and, and we can compare these numbers, and this is what is shown on the, on the right. This is the number of, uh, of ground-based detector versus the number of detection by LISA. And it is very interesting, they, they, they all are more or less of the same order of magnitude, precisely at, at, the, at the scales where, where these far side binaries would, would, would be located. So if you compare these uh, this number of events from ground-based and space-based detectors, something that you can do, for example, is constrain 
uh, the Redshift evolution. Now, uh, we have we have said that uh, this the, the detection these binary black holes above the gap they could be seen uh, from ground and space and it could happen also that you have the same event uh, is seen first in space and then on ground and this is what is called the the famous uh, multiband events uh, and here uh, this is uh, this plot shows the fraction of multiband events as a function of the total mass. And this is defined as those, those black holes which are first uh, detected by LISA and that merge within 10 years and then they are also detectable uh, by, by ground-based detectors. And what you can see is that for total masses below 100, uh, then it, it really doesn't matter uh, which uh, ground-based detector you are using because uh, your sensitivity is, is limited by the by the uh, high frequency noise of LISA. However, as you go to uh, higher masses, then you start to see differences. And that is because, as I was saying a moment ago, LISA is more sensitive to, to higher masses, but ground-based detectors, uh, uh, depending on their sensitivity at low, at low frequencies, they are more or, le or, or less uh, sensitive. But in any case, what you can see here, which is also clear, is that uh, uh, the fraction of, of multiband events could be dominated uh, if there is a population of, of binary black holes uh, above the gap. So these far side binaries could, could dominate the fraction of, of, of multiband events. Now, uh, with these uh, uh, far side binaries, there are many uh, things that you can do uh, in terms of uh, fundamental physics. Uh, you can learn about the physics of the per instability supernova gap. Uh, you can learn about astrophysical formation channels, tests of gravity, cosmology. Here, in what, in what follows, I will focus just on three simple points. Uh, first is uh, how well we can constrain this uh, uh, upper end of, of the mass gap. Uh, second uh, will be uh, what can we learn about the cosmic expansion from these, uh, from these uh, binaries. And third will be uh, what is the possible impact of these binaries on the stochastic background. So uh, for the first one, uh, uh, what, in order to determine how well we can constrain the minimum uh, far side binaries, what we, we consider is a, is a toy model for the, for the, for the far side uh, binary black holes in which we have a uniform uh, distribution of, of masses uh, which uh, start at a given a minimum value. So in this plot, you are seeing the number of detections for the different uh, uh, observatories as a function of the minimum mass of this population. Uh, and here again, the bands show the, the difference in the, in the redshift evolution. So, so you can see uh, uh, how, for example, uh, uh, as you move to the minimum mass, you move it to higher masses, uh, advanced LIGO will see less events. And then uh, you can also see here that Einstein telescope will be clearly the one detecting more events uh, and that LISA will do better uh, at higher mass. Now, from these events, uh, and then assuming that the distribution of the secondary mass uh, is uniformly distributed, then you can estimate uh, how well you will able to constrain the minimum mass. Uh, and this is what is shown on the, on the, on the right-hand panel. So this is the relative error on the determination of the minimum mass as a function of, 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 the, of the minimum uh, mass of this population. And you can see that in all the cases, you can achieve very, uh, very good constraints with just uh, that many events. And that is because the uh, uh, measuring this sharp uh, feature of, 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 the, of, the, of the mass distribution is much easier than, for example, uh, determining uh, uh, other quantities. So in other words, the scaling with the number of events of determining the edge of, of a distribution uh, scales with one of, over the number of events instead of one over the square root of the number of events. So with, with less events, it's easier to constrain. And why this knowing well where, what is the minimum far side mass is important, 
that is because this is precisely directly related to the physics of the per instability supernova gap that I was saying at the beginning. So this is a, a plot from Farmer et al, where they study, for example, how the uh, masses of the uh, of the black holes depend uh, on the uh, nuclear reactor, uh, this uh, nuclear reaction rate. So this is the this uh, region in white is the mass gap, and you can see that depending on the efficiency of this uh, nuclear reaction rate, then the the gap could be uh, at larger uh, uh, could start larger or smaller masses. So if, what we are saying is that I mean by if we are able to uh, to constrain well the the the, the minimum mass uh, of the far side binaries, we will be constraining this this upper upper part of of of, of this relation. So it's in, it's nice because this complements well the constraints that we we will have from from the from the lower end, and then you could can, you can constrain, for example, the duration of of the gap, which has uh, nice nice implications. The other thing that you can do with far side binaries is to use them uh, as as a standard silence, and that is because uh, when when we are uh, observing. Uh, so that is because all the masses that we are detecting are in the detector frame. So they, they, this means that they are red shifted. So uh, this in, pre, in principle uh, is a limitation because then, I mean, you don't know from the gravitational wave, you only get the, the luminosity distance. So uh, you, cannot, you cannot tell the true mass uh, without assuming a cosmology. However, in the case in which you have some feature in in your mass distribution as would be this uh, this uh, this mass gap, then you can use this as, this as a reference scale. So you know that, for example, let's say the the end of the mass gap is at 120 solar masses. So you know that this uh, is this is where the population of binaries above the gap will start. So then you can from your detections you can constrain this minimum uh, uh, far side binary mass as a function of uh, of the luminosity distance uh, and then uh, what this allows you is to obtain uh, just because you know the minimum mass then uh, you can uh, uh, infer uh, the redshift so you know the luminosity distance you know the redshift you can constrain uh, cosmology now there is uh, there is a caveat in, in this reasoning and is the fact that you have to assume that the location of the pair instability gap does not evolve significantly with redshift. So uh, meaning that uh, you are assuming that the typical uh, uh, formation uh, of, of these binaries uh, at low redshift uh, is, is the same as at high redshift and it essentially means like you are neglecting effects like metallicity and all these things. So this is, this is, a, this is an approximation but it's still uh, it is expected that the per instability gap does not change dramatically with redshift. So this this is a this is a, a, a good way in which one could uh, uh, standardize uh, these uh, these gravitational waves. And this was a first uh, proposed a test for the lower end of the mass gap uh, in this paper by by Faretal. So. Taking this, uh, what we can then now do is uh, estimate how well we could constrain the 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 uh, Hubble parameter uh, again as a function of the of the of the minimum mass, and uh, and this is the this is the plot on the left, uh, uh, and this corresponds to the relative error uh, at nine ninety percent confidence interval. So this means that. Uh, that uh, you can see that errors for Einstein telescope could be of the order of, 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 three, of three to five percent uh, for a, a plus between five and ten and for Lisa uh, around ten it could be lower or it could be higher so these are these are not uh, very com competitive compared to other uh, uh, standard science uh, but in any case, they, they, they are independent uh, source uh, of information about cosmology, which is also is always valuable. Uh, but also what is interesting is that 
uh, for each of the detectors, uh, you will be sensitive to, to the expansion rate at different redshifts. So for example, uh, a advanced LIGO will see mostly uh, binaries uh, at around redshift of 0.7, uh, a plus at around redshift of one, uh, a, a Einstein telescope at around redshift of uh, 1.2, I think it was, and, and Lisa could only see black holes which are much, much closer uh, and, and much lower redshift. So with, with each of these detectors you will, and using this method, you will measure the, uh, the Hubble parameter at different times so you could infer different information, cosmological information. And for Lisa, this will be uh, uh, particularly interesting uh, because then uh, by measuring the local expansion rate, one could uh, compare and cross calibrate with uh, LIGO and Virgo binary neutron stars. Finally, the last thing that I want to discuss about uh, far side binary science is the fact that uh, they will also imprint a, 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 a stochastic uh, background just from all the binaries that are not above threshold, but that they are still uh, seen in our detectors forming a, a background of unresolved binaries. So this background at least at frequencies will be very similar uh, to the one of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the stellar mass black holes below the, below the mass gap. However, for the case of ground-based detectors, something uh, interesting can happen, and is the fact that they could, the, this population above the gap could imprint uh, a, a bump in the, in the stochastic background, which will uh, change the, the standard F to the two thirds scaling. So the, the precise location of, of this, of this uh, bump uh, is, is sensitive to where the minimum mass is located. So this could be a way to also uh, identify uh, this, this population of, of far side binaries. And, and overall, I mean, the idea would be to, to use both uh, the, the number of detections and the stochastic background to, to, to look for, for, these, for these binaries. Okay, so this was uh, the first part of, of the talk. Uh, we have seen that LIGO and Virgo will be uh, we either detect or highly constrain this population of, of binary black holes above the mass gap. Uh, we have also seen that LISA uh, will uh, also detect to this population and in fact it could dominate the fraction of multiband events and that with uh, all the detectors there is a, a, a precise measurement of the far side binary mass uh, which is important for example to determine the uh, constrained nuclear reaction rates and this also allow us to, to learn about uh, cosmology and, to, and we can also see uh, these, uh, these uh, signatures of this new population in the stochastic background. So this is uh, all about a, a population that we hope to, to start detecting. Now, uh, for, the, for the second part of the talk, uh, I want to focus on, on binary black holes uh, on of all the kinds. I mean, meaning that essentially mostly uh, detections are uh, below the gap. And the, 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 sense, the essential point here is that we have seen that uh, with a higher sensitivity, the volume uh, of the detector, of the sensitivity volume of the detector will increase. Uh, the number of detections uh, will uh, become larger and larger. We've, we've seen this already from O2 to O2 to O3. And, and and then what, what this means is that as we are probing higher and higher redshift, then the probability that our uh, binary black hole signals are lens uh, just because they cross some uh, matter distribution in, on the line of sight will increase. So this is a, a plot of, for example, of the optical depth uh, as a function of, of the source redshift. And you can see how very rapidly increases uh, when the, uh, when the uh, redshift of the sources uh, goes uh, beyond redshift one. So this means that in the field, although for present detections, uh, lensing is, not some, is something which is uh, improbable, for future detectors, uh, lensing is something which is very important to take into account. And this could lead to a lot of uh, new information about, for example, the distribution of matter in the universe, 
uh, which I will not talk about, but uh, what I will focus on instead is, is how these lens signals are seen by gravitational wave detectors and what information we can, we can learn from, from those signals. So just uh, as, a, as a brief uh, recap, uh, what is different from, uh, from gravitational wave uh, lensing with respect to, uh, to, uh, to lensing of electromagnetic uh, radiation? Well, the first thing is that uh, gravitational waves, uh, they can have uh, astrophysical wavelengths. So the, uh, the typical uh, wavelength of, 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 the, of a gravitational wave is determined by the, by the scale of, 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 the, of, the, of the black holes, while for electromagnetic radiation, it is always uh, the wavelengths are, are, are much, more, much smaller than the, 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 uh, the elements that, that produce them. So what this means is that a gravitational wave could much easily be on the regime of wave optics in which the, uh, the wavelength of the, of, the, of the gravitational wave is of the size of, of the lens itself. So interference effects, diffraction effects could arise. And we, we had a, a, a paper recently about some of the things that could happen and one of those is that uh, there could be an apparent uh, superluminality of, of your signal. And, and well, if you're interested, uh, I could talk about this uh, at the end, uh, but I will not cover this. <laughs> anyway, the other, the other point of, a, a, the other difference, sorry, uh, uh, of gravitational wave uh, uh, lensing is that with gravitational wave, you are making an all sky survey. So this means that you are sensitive to, to all uh, gravitational wave from all directions. So you can really make constraints on the population of lenses as a whole. Uh, because, and this is uh, in contrast to targeted searches of lensing with electromagnetic radiation. On the negative side with gravitational waves, the localization is very poor. So it's, it's very, you cannot distinguish like a, the, uh, if you, in the case of multiple images, you cannot distinguish where these images are located. And the third uh, difference, which will be the most important for what comes now, is the fact that gravitational waves are coherently detected. So uh, this means that you are sensitive to all the, uh, you are sensitive also to the face of the gravitational waves. And we will see uh, now that this is, this is very important. So when you are solving uh, lensing, what you want to solve is the, is the diffraction integral, which take into account all the possible paths of the wave from the uh, source to the observer. Now, if you are in the regime of uh, the stationary phase approximation or geometric optics, in which uh, the time delay uh, between, the, uh, between the, the stationary points of this integral is uh, uh, larger than the than the uh, than the uh, typical period of, of of the signal. Then you are in, in a regime in which you can distinguish separate images. So you are in the regime of a strong lensing, and uh, a gravitational wave could uh, split into uh, into different images. So that your diffraction integral becomes a sum over the different images. This is J is the uh, is the level for the for each of the images, and each of the images will be characterized by three elements. First is the uh, magnification of the, of the uh, gravitational wave. Uh, second is the time delay, uh, which is essentially when the, when the wave arrives. And third uh, is the fact that there will be an overall uh, phase shift uh, associated to the type of uh, image that you have. So, the type of image depends on the, on the lensing potential, and essentially there are three types. If the lensing potential has a minimum, then this is called a type one image. And this type one image has no uh, associated phase shift. However, for type two images, which corresponds to a saddle point in the, in the, in the lensing potential, then you have a, a phase shift, which is uh, which corresponds to pi halves. 
And the third type of images uh, is when you have a maximum in your lensing potential and then you have a, a, a phase shift of pi. This uh, phase shift can also be understood in terms of uh, how many times the, 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 the light bundle crosses caustics, uh, but uh, I, will, I, I will not enter into the very details of this, but just, just what it will be important is that lensing introduces a constant phase shift, which depends on the type of image. And then this is very important because as I was saying, you, with gravitational wave, you are sensitive to the phases of, of the signal. So then you can use this phase shift to distinguish between different type of images. And this is very nice because then it's extra information that you can use to constrain the lens model, for example. So we, so we will have these, uh, these uh, a fixed uh, phase shift introduced by lensing. And these uh, will have uh, some, uh, some interesting effects. So for example, uh, here on the top panel, I'm showing the, the case of, a, of a, a sinusoid modulated by a Gaussian. So it's a, it's a signal which is uh, dominated by a single frequency. It's almost a monochromatic signal. And then on the left panel, what you are seeing is that uh, is uh, how the, uh, uh, is the lens image, is, is the lens images. So this uh, big signal, corresponds to the first image, and then uh, sometime later, it arrives the second image, which is demagnified, uh, and is a type two image. Now, if you uh, uh, forget about the, for, uh, about the magnification, and you rescale the time so that uh, both images arrive at, uh, at the same time, so you essentially define your delta t subtracting the time of arrival of each of the images, then you have something like on the right panel on the top right panel. Uh, and this, the, this then you are seeing uh, on green, the type one image, uh, and on red, the uh, type two image. So what you can see is that the, the difference essentially in this case uh, between the two images is that just there is a, 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 a time shift uh, introduced by this uh, uh, constant phase shift. So just the location of the maximums is shifted from one to the other, but the waveform, the wave packet, sorry, is the same. Now, what happens if we look to a signal which is not monochromatic? And we can model this in a toy model just by taking a Gaussian pulse. So you have a Gaussian pulse, so you have a distribution of, of, of frequencies. Uh, and then in this case, uh, this again is the lens uh, signal. This is the first image, this is the second image. And now when you uh, look, uh, you eliminate the magnification, you uh, align the arrival times, then what you get is, is, this, is, this, uh, is this result. Essentially, uh, the wave packet is completely distorted. And you can understand uh, this distortion uh, from the uh, case of the, of, of the time delay, which is introduced by, which, sorry, by the fact that the time delay to each frequency is different. So for example, the fact that we, uh, the maximum now becomes a, a node is just from the fact that the time delay for these uh, very small frequencies becomes very, very large. And then uh, you could also do the mapping from all the rest, but what you can see is that the fact that there is a phase shift, which is constant in frequency, makes that the time uh, domain signal could be deformed. Uh, and, and this is very important. And why is important? Well, because we know that gravitational waves uh, on the first part, uh, they are chirping signals. So they are changing the frequency from the spiral first to the merger. Moreover, gravitational waves in general can be a complex system which, which contains different modes with different frequencies. So this means that in general, when a gravitational wave is lens, the, the result could be distorted with compared to the unlensed signal. Or in other words, that the lens gravitational wave could differ from the unlensed uh, general relativity waveform. So this is, this is different uh, to what happens uh, with electromagnetic radiation and, and, and it's something which is uh, very interesting. So we can understand this uh, a bit better just by looking at the, at the degeneracies 
uh, uh, of, of, of the parameters, uh, uh, sorry, of the generalization of the lens signal with the astrophysical parameters. So this is the, uh, here we have the, uh, the unlens signal. This is the strain, which is just taking into account the plus and the cross polarization with the uh, with corresponding antenna patterns. And you can rewrite this signal in terms of a single function, which you have omega, which is the frequency uh, of the binary, uh, phi c, which is a coalescence phase. And then you have a term, an extra phase, which comes from the from the depends on the antenna pattern. Now, if we say, okay, let's lens this signal, and in particular, let's focus on the type two image. So we will have these three uh, elements that I was describing. First, you will have a change in the amplitude uh, due to the magnification. You will have a change in the in the time delay, and you will also be introducing an extra phase. So you can see that in this case, uh, this extra phase is completely degenerate with the with the with a change in the coalescence phase. So if you change the coalescence phase by pi over four, then you are uh, recovering exactly what the lens signal is. On the same way, you could also change uh, your uh, uh, orientation angle psi so that uh, this chi to two quantity has a pi over four change, uh, which also uh, 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 corresponds to the, to the, to, to the lensing phase. So this means that for signals as this one, which are dominated by the quadruple radiation, there is an exact degeneracy between the uh, lens signal and the uh, and the and a change in the coalescence phase. But but this is but this is just a, a, an approximate uh, degeneracy because gravitational wave uh, will contain typically higher modes, and these higher modes will uh, inevitably break this this degeneracy. And we, can, and, we can, and we are going to see now this on, on a few examples. So for example, for the case of uh, equal masses, this on the left, again, is the lens signal, the, the two images, right? And then on the right, what we are comparing is the, the type one image and the type two without the magnification as before. And we are superimposing different uh, waveforms, which are not lens, but in which some of the parameter has been changed. So for example, uh, on the top uh, right panel, this is the case of uh, equal mass binary without inclination. Then uh, you can see that the uh, cyan uh, dash line, uh, which changes the coalescence phase, uh, precisely recovers the, uh, the uh, type two image. Now, when you have inclination, you are more sensitive to the higher modes. And this is the case which we have on the bottom panel with some inclination. And then you can see in this case that the, uh, that the dash C and line does not match perfectly the type two image. If we have now asymmetric masses, in this case is the mass ratio is one over 10. So the massive black hole uh, is 10 times the smaller, the lighter black hole, then you can see that the differences are very are very large. So this is because as you increase the mass ratio, then you are increasing the relevance of the higher modes. And something similar happens uh, again uh, if you, for example, allow to have a, a precession. So if you have uh, a, the spins of the of the binary black holes are not aligned. Uh, and and this is uh, again the two cases. I, I don't want to enter into the details because essentially the idea is the same, but precession will also break this degeneracy, eccentricity will also break this degeneracy. Now, then the final question, of course, is okay, how this uh, will affect uh, the detection of the signals? Uh, because I mean, when we are doing match filtering, we are using a general relativity template uh, and we are looking for a signal with this template. And now you are saying that lensing could distort the signal, so then you will uh, uh, you will not uh, there will not be a, a perfect matching with any of the templates. Still, uh, so this is true, but still, what uh, what we what we found in the paper is that for typical lens binaries, uh, the signal will not be missed because the difference in the in the in the 
uh, introduced by the lensing phase shift uh, is not large enough. So we, we made an analysis uh, looking at the effect of the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and this is what is, uh, is displayed on this, on this plot. So just I will describe this one top plot on the, uh, on the left. This is the signal to noise ratio uh, using different templates, which are described here. As a, fun, uh, as a compared to the uh, optimal uh, optimal uh, signal to noise ratio, in which uh, there is a, uh, in which the, the right template the, is, is used. I mean the template which is just the lens signal. So and, and here on the x-axis, this is the mass ratio. So equal binary and very asymmetric binaries. And you can see like how the uh, the signal to noise ratio, for example, of the case of using uh, a shift in the coalescence phase uh, decreases as we increase uh, as we decrease the the mass ratio. So as higher modes become more important, then this uh, approximate the generacy is more and more broken, and the lens signal is more and more different from a general relativity waveform. Still, the differences are not large uh, enough so that they will not be detected. But if you don't recognize this effect this will inevitably introduce a, a bias in your, uh, in your parameter estimation. So we did the same for precession and eccentricity, and we found the, the, the same thing. So that is also one point, is that, I mean, if you go to very extreme binaries, uh, then these effects could be much more larger. But uh, for the typical parameters, for example, in the precession or the eccentricity that we consider, these effects are not uh, so large. So uh, uh, since I'm running out of time, I uh, just uh, said that, I mean, when you are looking for a strongly lens uh, gravitational wave, this phase inf information is very important. So it should be included uh, first when you are looking for candidates, but more important, you should include this phase shift when you are uh, analyzing the consistency of the different images. And the best way to do it is just to uh, apply directly this phase shift in frequency domain, because then in this way, you avoid all the problems uh, of the approximate generacies with uh, GR templates. And you can use also the phase shift uh, to look for, uh, uh, for sub-threshold events. So uh, this is all I wanted to say. I had some extra slides about uh, testing uh, gravity. Uh, with uh, gravitational wave, but I, I will stop here to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jose Maria, for the talk. Uh, is, is, there, is there any question from the audience? Please just uh, unmod yourself and, uh, and talk. Okay, there is a hand up from, from Mario Espera. Yeah, you, you, you can talk, just un unmute yourself. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so, um, thank you so much for your very interesting talk, Jose. Um, I just have actually one comment more than a question, and my comment is about your slide. Uh, I guess it was slide 12, uh, the one about nuclear reaction rates. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one, yeah, thanks. So um, as, as far as I know, it's uh, actually unlikely that you are going to constrain anything about nuclear reaction rates, depending on how many black holes we will detect within or beyond the per instability gap. Well, this is simply because the uncertainties that we have on the edges of the per instability mass gap depend not only on nuclear reaction rates, but also on, for example, a fallback fraction convection or stellar rotation and many other stellar evolution aspects. So all these aspects basically show the degeneracy with, it, with, with the uncertainties that we have on nuclear reaction rates. So uh, I, I don't know if it will be possible to distinguish between all these sources of uncertainty and we use them and to use them to constrain nuclear reaction rates. So that, that was my uh, only comment. I don't know if you agree with that or if you want to comment on this point. Thank you so yeah, much. Well, no, no problem. No, no. Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair point. Uh, uh, I was taking here the, the words and the result from these authors. Uh, I'm sure that there, yeah, that there, there are 
more the genesis. Uh, so I, uh, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I didn't, I didn't do this analysis, so I, I don't know exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's something which is relevant to take into account, uh, and and it might be difficult to to uh, pinpoint maybe the re, re, uh, nuclear reaction rate, but uh, still like uh, constraining the width of, of, of the per instability supernova gap, I think is very important, and I'm sure it will constrain some parts of the parameter space of of of, of all the things you have said. So uh, maybe it's not only the nuclear reaction rate. But I'm sure like this information will be relevant to constrain uh, some portion of this parameter space. Okay, is there any other question? Okay, I, I, mean, I, can, I want to ask something. At the end, you talk about the, um, uh, the effect of lens on the gravitational waves. Uh, but yes. wh which kind, uh, because, I mean, because in principle, I believe that you need a really strong effect in order to to see this, right? So, which kind of um, mergers, which kind of events do you need in order to see a seizable effect that you can then use to to learn something? Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, that's a fair point. So, uh, so for example, I mean, uh, uh, what is I mean? So I think, I mean, the fact that you have some distortion uh, already in something like this, which is a mass ratio of one over 10, uh, you can see some distortion of, of, of the signal. Maybe here is not the best case, but for example, uh, if you have eccentricity uh, uh, as well, you could change it, or if you have precession. I mean, the fact is that here we were limited uh, in some sense by the waveforms that we were using. So our, the waveform that we were using has some range of validity. So it's not, it's not that we know the, uh, the signal of the gravitational wave to, to, uh, to arbitrary large uh, eccentricity or precession. So we, we, could, we could not test uh, the, how the lens signal changed for those. But what you can see, for example, very clearly uh, from this trend of the, of the uh, of the SNR loss is that you can see that the relative difference in the signal to noise ratio for effective uh, uh, for the effective precession parameter of 0.5 are already large. I mean, of the are already large, and, and if you go to to higher uh, values of the of the precession, then you will have uh, more deviations. So these kind of situations could happen, for example, if you have binaries which are formed in a hierarchical way in which uh, you uh, the, the binaries acquire some eccentricity or uh, they, they have some some additional uh, 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 misalignment of, of the spins but uh, it is true that for the binaries that we are detecting so far this uh, this effect will be small but who knows I mean if the next populations that uh, we detect, will have uh, more extreme parameters. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is a question in the chat. I, I can read it. Uh, could we hypothetically detect the events obtained in O3 with sensibility of O1 and O2? Could we detect the events of O3? Uh, I'm sure some of them, yes. Uh, I don't know, uh, I mean, not all of them for sure, but uh, uh, I mean, like the, well, I don't know exactly what was the, the improvement in the sensitivity, but uh, the, the essential factor is that, I mean, if, if you change the sensitivity uh, by a given factor, then you are increasing the volume uh, 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 by this factor to the cube. Uh, so at least uh, uh, I would say like, uh, if you know the difference in the sensitivities, which I don't remember now, you could determine which fraction of, of the O3 events uh, could have been seen with the with previous sensitivity. Okay, um, well, let me take a last question from mm -hmm. Eduardo. You can uh, unmute yourself and, and ask. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, about the waveforms that 
show on slide 24, 25, uh, where you uh, stressed the importance of the phase shift. I'm wondering whether these uh, waveforms have the same uh, or almost the same representation in the time frequency plane. Sorry, could you repeat the last part? Uh, when, when you display the chirps uh, uh, for, yes. for the merging black holes, uh, uh, those are representations in the time frequency maps. Uh, so these are just uh, representations in the time domain. Uh, would you obtain, even though there are, there are phase shifts, would you obtain uh, similar uh, representations in the time frequency map for these signals? Right. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. Um, I mean, the so the phase shift is is uh, applies to the to the in the, so in the frequency domain, the phase shift is very simple to see. Uh, but on the on the time domain is where these uh, distortions arises. So uh, that also means that I mean. Excuse me. May 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 I? Better clarify my question. Yeah, please. The point is, please, please. Uh, how would these signals be detected in uh, uh, LIGO Virgo? The point is that the time frequency maps are very important for the detection. So, uh, if uh, uh, the signals are similar, uh, it is very likely mm -hmm. that uh, uh, with the, detect the current detection algorithms, it would be possible to uh, detect similar shapes in the time frequency maps and therefore also um, um, detect uh, fairly easily this kinds uh, of signals which uh, displays phase, phase shifts. So uh, if mm -hmm. there is such a, um, if this is the case, then uh, detection is not so difficult. Otherwise, uh, uh, it may be considerably more difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I think that the fact that what we are, I mean, the plus that I was showing about the changes in the signal to noise ratio, those uh, also uh, are, uh, are showing what you what you what you said the fact that uh, they they can they can be detected so it is it's not that you are missing the signal so by by doing this much filtering uh, in which you are uh, looking at the uh, the the overlap of your template with the with the with the data uh, then uh, you you can you can get you can get these signals uh, yeah so I I think that's that's it. Okay, thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you everyone for the questions and also thank you again, Jose Maria, for the talk. Uh, we finish here. Just before you leave, let me remind you that uh, next week we will have 